In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. We heard in the Gospel, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Ghost. Who sins you forgive are forgiven them, and who sins you retain are retained. In order to appreciate the mercy of God, let's consider with the help of Thomas Aquinas, the common doctor of the church, that our blessed Lord restored to life three dead persons, namely, the daughter of Jairus, the official. Secondly, the son of the widow of Nain, who was being carried out of the city to be buried. And then thirdly, of course, we have Lazarus, who had been four days in the grave. Three persons. Now let's recall some of the facts surrounding each case. The daughter of Jairus was restored to life at home shortly after dying. The son of the widow outside of the city as he was being carried to his tomb. And Lazarus was restored to life in the grave after being there four days. Our Lord brought back to life the little girl when only a few witnesses were with him, namely Peter, James, and John. On the other hand, a great crowd was present when Jesus restored to life the young man being carried out of the city of Nain. And finally, a very great multitude was at hand when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. So we turn to St. Thomas. Now he says, these three dead persons bringing, being brought back to life signify three classes of sinners. Some people sin in their hearts by consenting to mortal sins and thus they die. These are designated by the girl dead at home. She was still young in sin, a child, St. Thomas says. Now, on the other hand, there are those who sin by external signs, by actions, or those who sin with others. These are signified by the dead young man who was being carried out to be buried, accompanied by a crowd. He is older in sin. He was an adolescent young man. But... When through sinful habits, sinners become fixed in sin and become notorious, then they are, as it were, bound and buried in the grave, rotting and stinking. St. Philip Neri says, the stench of impurity before God and the angels is so great that no stench in the world can equal it. Recall that St. Mary Magdalene, the sister of Lazarus, and a notorious sinner had seven demons cast out of her by our Lord. Seven demons. In a certain sense, she was perfectly dead, perfectly possessed, perfectly dead in sin. Now, such sinners as these are signified by Lazarus. They are mature in sin. They are adults. Nevertheless, the merciful Lord raised all three of them from the dead. All three of them are raised from the dead, indicating that he resuscitates all classes of sinners. If only they will hear his voice. For he spoke to each one of them, didn't he? Calling them back to life, and they came back to life. When seeing the saints in heaven, the mystic blessed Mary of Jesus crucified, a 19th century Carmelite, she said, In heaven, the most beautiful trees are those that have sinned the most, but they have used their miseries as manure around the trunk. We have to do our part. We have to take our sins once confessed and turn them into fertilizer. How do we do that? Through growing in sorrow for sin. The more sorrow we are for our sins, the more they're turned into fertilizer and we overcome ourselves more rapidly and become more holy. Fertilizer is the sorrow. More sorry, more fertilizer. Well, here are a few lessons we can learn from these things we've discussed, these three persons. Number one, we should never doubt the mercy of God. 
St. John Chrysostom compares our sins to God's mercy as to a spark is to an ocean. St. John Chrysostom. His mercy can overcome any sin. He can overcome any rottenness, even those who have been in the tomb for four days and are stinking. Have we given up on anyone in our life? Sometimes I wonder how a country like Russia is ever going to be converted, or France, the eldest daughter of the church, or even our own country. Will they be converted? How can that happen? How can France come back and be again the great daughter of the church? How is Russia going to convert when nearly every woman in Russia has had multiple abortions? Can Russia become holy again? Yes. Lazarus proves it. God's grace is very powerful. In the story of the daughter of Jairus, several people doubted our Lord and even laughed at Him and ridiculed Him. I think this sort of behavior is still going on today, both in a direct manner, directly attacking the church, and also in a sort of indirect manner. In a direct manner, when people look at the church and claim that she is powerless in helping sinners to rise out of sin. This often happens after scandals, right? Look, not even your priests can be holy. Give up. What's the use? The church doesn't help people anymore. That's what the media wants us to think. That's what the world wants us to think. Another example of that would be after the world wars of the 20th century, many doubted, many in the church herself, doubted her ability to overcome evil in the world. They were looking at these world wars and saying, look, what we've been doing didn't work. And so they turned to something else. They turned to the world and tried more man-made solutions. Or they just gave up and started living a more worldly life. Then there are those who say this sort of in an indirect manner, more or less by their actions. Many people do this, most often unknowingly, by seeking remedies for their sins and their sinful addictions outside of the church, some sort of a program or a counseling. Programs that are humanistic or based on modern or even occult psychological techniques. An example of this would be the 12-step program. And sometimes there's Eastern occult spirituality. People turn to yoga, Reiki, transcendental meditation, all kinds of stuff. Yet each one of these is not of God. They are each and every one of them a dead end, a distraction from God such that they can keep man from responding to the voice of God. Very dangerous. In each of these three cases, the dead person responded to the voice of God in the gospel. We heard about that. It was his voice. They heard it and they responded and they rose up. Only God's mercy can remove the defects of sin. That's what mercy is. It removes defects. And what's the biggest defect that's got to go first? Guilt. Guilt must be taken away. I'm sorry, 12-step programs do not remove guilt. There is no removal of guilt in these programs. We must never forget that the only sin that cannot be taken away by Christ is the one that's not brought to Him, that's not given to Him. And He gave us the method to give it to Him in confession. Only God can remove defects. Think of the wounds of our Lord Jesus Christ. They remove the defect of unbelief in St. Thomas. They're still doing it today. Christ yesterday, Christ today, Christ forever. He's the same. We must never doubt the mercy of God, but we must seek it where it can be found. Where is it found? In the Holy Roman Catholic Church the mystical body of Christ. First lesson, 
Now, second lesson. Others have some role to play in the cure. Once man sins mortally, he's dead and unable to move on the spiritual plane. Recall how Lazarus shows this especially by his being wrapped up in burial claws. He's behind a, a stone door in a tomb. We can meet with other people and be reaffirmed and feel good about ourselves that, hey, I'm not alone. Other people are having this problem too. There's a certain relief in that. I can share my problems. I can manage them with the help of other people. We can go to counseling sessions on a regular basis. I can go to these meetings every week and I can manage my sin. That's what's happening with them, these 12-step things. I can even stop sinning for a time with the help of these people. But this is a horizontal solution. It's just a managing of our sin, not a removal. Since those who sin mortally are dead, only the voice of the Lord calling them back to life can save them. This is the gospel. This is what motivated all the missionaries heretofore. They're like, we've got to get the gospel in the ears of the people so they will hear the word of God. They will hear his voice and they will rise up from the dead. Let us take careful note that all three of the persons mentioned have something in common besides having been dead. There was someone interceding for them. Someone had to ask the Lord to bring them back to life. In the case of the daughter, her father Jairus came and fell at the feet of our Lord, begging him to help her. In the case of the widow, it was the tears of his mother. And we know that it was at the request of Mary Magdalene that our Lord brought Lazarus back to life. Her tears made him cry. In all three cases, those interceding shed tears. Throughout the writings of the mystics and the visionaries that are approved by the church, our Lord is always asking with his mother to pray for the conversion of sinners. At Fatima, Our Lady said it over and over, we are to pray for the conversion of sinners and to pray for the conversion of Russia. He wanted us to pray for them before he will speak to them, calling them back to life. So do we pray for the conversion of sinners? Do we have masses said for the fallen aways in our family, in our friends, in our relatives? If we sin, think about it, so few people are praying these times. Are we so sure that anybody's going to intercede for us? That ought to motivate us. I'm not sinning. There might not be anybody that's going to help me come back. Are we so sure that we will even have ears open to hear the voice of the Lord? God's mercy endures forever, the psalmist says, but we can choose not to listen. Our Lady said in the Magnificat, God has mercy on who? Those who fear Him. Let us not get presumptuous in our own use of God's mercy. God has mercy on those who fear Him. These are the reasons why we should never allow ourselves to sin or to presume on God's mercy. And then finally, third, the gospel is clear. This restoration from death to life takes shape in the church through the sacraments of, the, of baptism for those not yet members of the church or the sacrament of confession for those who are. These are the sacraments for the dead. They bring them back to life. And we also can say that confession prevents us from dying again, so we go regularly to prevent ourselves from dying this is the point of contact for us with the mercy of God. When a member of the church has fallen into sin, this is the sacrament by which they must return. And as the gospel indicates, it's an Easter sacrament. The Lord gave the apostles their faculties to hear confessions on Easter Sunday. He wanted the sacrament used. He also wants us to use it frequently. And not just as a preparation for Easter, this is how addictions are truly conquered and life restored. We go to confession. 
And I put out for you a little handout on a confession story that goes way back to the early church. There was a man who committed all kinds of sins and his desert father had him confess them publicly. And as he was confessing them, an angel was there and he checked off each sin as he confessed them and he wiped them out. Can you imagine that? There they go, one by one. They can no longer be held against him. I don't know about you. That's a very pleasing image. And I want that in my life. All those sins gone, one by one. These three figures, once dead, brought back into life, show us that no matter what kind of sins we or our beloved ones have committed, complete restoration is possible and can be achieved through the mercy of God, starting with a good confession. Confession filled with sincerity and true sorrow. Let's not let this Easter sacrament go unused, but rather respond to the voice of God calling us to fullness of life. Also, let us always be praying for the conversion of sinners, even with tears. And when we cannot pray enough, we should have others pray. That's why we have convents. That's why we have cloistered convents, especially write to them and say, please pray for this person. And they will. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Amen.